I just draw a couple of lines, but they need to be filled in with black. One of the ways that uh, the digital world has made a difference in the way I draw used to be I had to do that manually, like that. But in a moment I'll show you uh, how that stops being necessary. Howard Cruz was one of the greatest cartoonists of his generation and is affectionately known uh, among those of us in the LGBTQ comics community as the godfather of queer comics. Howard Cruz unfortunately passed away in November of 2019 from cancer. Howard's work was spectacular and groundbreaking, both in how he transformed the craft of cartooning and in the complicated content matter he addressed. Uh, Howard was also an activist, a mentor, a community builder, and a very, very generous friend. Some of Howard's many friends and colleagues, as well as cartoonists that he influenced, are here to share their memories of Howard and his work. We all miss Howard so much, and we are very grateful to have had him in our lives. Thank you for joining us to celebrate Howard's life. We're going to be focusing on early days uh, in the underground because the four of you are uniquely qualified to talk about the underground years, uh, as anyone who's familiar with your work can say. So when did Howard first come across your radar as an underground cartoonist? Uh, I met him at, again in the 70s, I guess in maybe in the mid 70s, he came to San Francisco for one of our conventions and we got to meet him. And he was such a lovely guy. I was familiar with Barefoots. Um, we, when I was in college, there was a head shop where we bought all the comics. I mean, Barefoots and Crumb and all of Trina's, Trina's comics. And um, yet, it, to me, it really stood out. I mean, because it was in this, you know, cute style, but his sense of humor was just, just really different. And that's what I like. I mean, I'm, I don't like same old, same old. So it really, really stood out to me. And it was refreshing. It, that's what I meant to say earlier. I was a fan. I read everybody's work. And by, you know, I discovered Howard as soon as he published. I think, I don't even remember where he first started, but I was always aware of him. And you know, his work was like a breath of fresh air compared to all the other male cartoonists. Uh, you know, he, he wasn't out trying to outrage you. He was trying to make you think. He, yeah, he was trying to make you think. And that was the huge, the biggest difference right there. Robert, what you just said about compared to the other male under cartoonists, that is the thing. His stuff was nice. And in the underground, sometimes it seemed as though nice was a no-no. When I first saw Howard's work, I was 18 or 19 years old, living in an attic in Salt Lake City. I was a, a huge fan of underground comics, and I read everybody else's work. I reviewed gay comics for the gay press, and then Howard invited me into the second issue. And I was very casual about it. I, you know, I, I never had any drive to take over gay comics or anything like that. So I never met Howard. I met Trina in 1984, and I met Howard a year later. So that's... So all my perspective before that is as a fan, a, a, a very devoted fan. And we were just friends after that. And friendship with a mentor, he was a mentor as well as a friend. He gave me extremely good advice when I was in the hot seat of editing. Um, but mostly his sense of humor and his thoughtfulness is what struck me the most. Dennis, how did Howard come on to your radar? Um, I know that you published a few um, of the Barefoots cartoons in Bizarre Sex and some of your other anthologies um, before you did the Barefoots Funnies collections. But how, how did he come across your, your vision? I think we had a mutual friend in Lee Mars. They were involved mm -hmm. in some kind of a college syndicate. And so one day I just got some of his samples in the mail and he mentioned Lee. Of course, I would have loved his work even if you know it hadn't come with a recommendation. But as everyone's already noted, they were so different and so fresh and uh, superficially cute. But when you actually read them, they were you know often pretty heavy duty. Uh, they were misleadingly cute. <laughs> and so from the beginning, Howard uh, found his way into I think every anthology I did. Snarf. Bizarre Sex, Death Rattle, you name it. It wasn't until 
sometime 78, 79. Not sure what year I learned that Howard was gay. Remember, we, we never met in the early years and it wasn't something that was discussed in correspondence until I was reading Barefoots and he had this artist named Hedrack who was gay. And I just, I just remember thinking to myself, gosh, I wonder if that's an autobiographical element. So in those days, we mostly wrote letters to each other. And I just said to him at one point, uh, no offense, Howard, but is, is this maybe autobiographical? And he said, well, yes, it is. And that's how I first found out. So that was probably turning around in my head when I realized there ought to be an anthology of gay cartoonists. So I remember asking him if he would, if he liked the idea and if he would edit it. And he said he loved the idea, but he was frankly concerned that if he were to edit that, it could cost him his freelance career because even in New York City where he had just moved, um, art directors might have held it against him if he were publicly gay. So he thought about it for a while. And I know he, Eddie's told me too, they talked about it. And finally he said, I want to do it. I think it's important. And that's when Gay Comics was born in 79. I just felt how brave he was to do this. You know, not only that, that, that he might lose freelance work in the ordinary straight, un, non-underground world, but that I have mentioned the underground clique before and they were they were very homophobic they were notoriously homophobic those guys and i thought well, my god what a brave man i should say when howard agreed he would edit it he said only one problem i don't know any other gay cartoonists <laughs> and uh, neither did i so i said all right we'll we'll send a form letter to everybody in my rolodex well neither did i when i became the so editor of gay comics but i got to know them pretty fast you know, I reviewed that first issue of Gay Comics, and I think one of the first things I said is when, you know, artists, illustrators, and other, you know, creators come out of the closet, they put their entire careers on the line. What I encouraged artists in the underground comics to do is just be yourself. So Howard's was unusual in that it was particularly cute, but if you just stopped to actually read what was in the balloons, <laughs> his characters were taking LSD, there were the plenty of sexual innuendo and uh, adult topics. It was not a kid comic. It was not a mainstream comic. Howard had told me that he was inspired by women's comics and the work that people like Trina were doing, getting people to like tell real stories, which determined the course he wanted to take in gay comic. As a cartoonist, Howard was pretty unusual in his approach. And I think the influence on that is the fact that his father was a minister. Because Howard, in a way, was sort of a cartooning minister to us all. His cartoons were about how to live a happy life, and justice, and fairness, and the good things that we should all use for. They weren't really sermons, but they were like parables. He was just ins inspirational to everybody, just like his content, his dedication to his art. And um, you know, like I say, he was an inspiration. You know, the importance of gay comics, you know, that he opened up the previously completely cisgendered underground comic scene. That is, that's major, that's a major accomplishment. Howard started it. Howard and Dennis started it. Howard yeah. and Dennis, yes, thank you, Dennis. <laughs> that's a nice thing to end it on. So let's uh, raise our pens in tribute to Howard and Hope he sees this somewhere, wherever he is. <laughs> Thank you. Indeed, you bet. Are you Howard? I was 13 or 14 when I first saw gay comics on the stands. I could only afford a glance or two at it then furtively, but it told me that not only were there gay comics, but that there were also gay people creating comics. In 1988, I wrote the massive two-part article, Gays in Comics, The Creators and the Creations, for Amazing Heroes magazine. Not only was Howard the only person in the industry that I interviewed who would identify as gay, but he also provided a lovely illustration for the article. 
Like a guardian angel, Howard stood behind me every step of the way as I began my journey as the first openly gay comic creator in the mainstream comic world, as opposed to the underground comics. He was there every time I called, with fear, with questions, with triumphs and defeats, and he was always, always unfailingly polite, even-tempered, and just a little bit sly. Howard appeared on my Comic-Con panel, Gays and Comics, four times and supported me through my 13 issues of Gay Comics. Recently, Howard reunited with Robert and I as guests of honor at the first Queers and Comics academic conference, and the three of us have done preliminary work on curating the complete gay comics for a publisher. While we all did groundbreaking work in the field and created opportunities for LGBTQ creators worldwide, Robert and I always bowed down to Howard's history and birthing of openly gay cartooning. And now, Howard is no longer here. To say that this news devastated me and everyone who had loved his work and the man is a vast understatement. If there is any justice in this world for a talent as great as Howard Cruz's and a soul as forthright, readers will go pick up his books and have a chuckle, and his soul will be as he wanted it, dancing naked with the angels. Howard Cruz was such an important part of my life and of queer comics. And it's really hard to imagine queer comics without Howard. Um, he was one of my first mentors and he created a community where we could all thrive. And I am here with a group of cartoonists to talk about Howard, uh, Ivan. Howard, Howard was a, a pretty big influence on me. He took me to my first uh, comic book convention to sell my comics. Uh, he invited me to uh, sit next to him. Uh, which was an amazing, interesting uh, experience, particularly since like we had this bubble. It was such a crowded convention back then. We had this bubble that was like no one would go through and enter. And it was like uh, this weird void. And um, we noticed that only the bravest people came and picked up one of our comics and stuff like that. Not only was he like a really big influence, he was just like the coolest friend to have. You know, I mean, he was like Mr. History in comics, Mr. History of gay comics. I always thought just by virtue of getting a sense of Howard's um, presence in the world of comics, I immediately started thinking of him as the godfather of gay comics. And so when I met him, I think I was a little concerned of, about whether or not he'd be accessible and approachable. And I just couldn't believe how warm uh, he was uh, to me. Yeah, I was, I was also Rupert. I was like, what is this guy like? You know, his, his gay comics to me, I consider them underground um, at the time, or definitely fringe, but his style is high contrast, black and white drawing. I was like, wow, this guy is like a seriously improved version of Robert Crumb. You know, he was, our, he was ours. Um, and um, so when I met him, I don't know what I expected, but here was this quiet, unassuming Southern boy standing there, you know, but then I realized he, you know, he was so astute. He was standing there like a sponge, taking everything in, like from a 360 vision, you know, he was, he was fantastic and so supportive, you know, and so humble, you know, he didn't blow his own horn. He just did his thing and he totally was the godfather. He paved the way for so many different styles and, and all of us, you know, and it never ended. It still continues to this day. He was a definite trailblazer, you know, and the sweetest guy who had a really severe inside edge that, that came out in his work too a lot. So um, definitely influenced me. Amazing man, amazing man. I think it was like 93 maybe 94, but I think I'm going to just say 93. And that's when I met him. And I was really awed. I had been reading Howard since my roommate of like in the early 80s gave me these comics, these gay comics. I was like, WTF is gay comics. What? I felt I like I had like come home. I just ravished them all for, uh, he, uh, he edited the first four issues 
and they're all classics and they're wonderful and I wish they could get reprinted in a beautiful book or something. Um, so when I got to actually meet him, I was in awe and I was nervous. Also, would he be approachable? Would he be this kind of godlike figure? No, Howard is just like totally, you can talk to him like anybody else. He's a Southern gentleman. And um, over the years, he helped me so many times. He always showed up. Every time I had something going, whether it be at a panel or a book signing or whatever, he was always there. And he always, he just, he showed up. He was a real Southern gentleman and just an amazingly talented person, so. Thank you. Um, in, from 1983 to 1985, Howard did a comic called Wendell that was printed in The Advocate and it showed a story about gay community which no one had ever really explored in comic form. Ivan, do you want to say something about Wendell? You know, Wendell was one of, uh, the advocate was one of the first things I picked up when I was kind of like feeling myself and, and my, my orientation. Uh, I remember I, I, uh, maybe the last year of my college, 83, I picked up the book and I just like read this comic and it was just, I wanted more and more and more. And, um, and I remember Wendell, was kind of like crunchy, you know, and it was, it was, it was crunchy like how it was, you know, and when I mean crunchy, it's like, you know, how it seemed to be like the seventies was really influential on him, <laughs> the sixties and the seventies. And, you know, and it, him and Eddie together, were, they just seemed like a, um, a, a photo frozen in the seventies, whatever shape they came up and then the closing style and the way they acted. And just like, this is Howard and Eddie, and this is the way they are. And this is this sweet Southern thing. And that was in, in Wendell and Wendell, was really interesting because it was political. It showed different points of view. It showed um, it did show family, uh, gay folks as family. Um, you got to remember that back in the old days, gay people were kind of treated as victims or, or evil people um, in a lot of the media, uh, on TV, or, or people to, be, to laugh at. And seeing a comic like that, where not only they, they have a normal life, but they have like concerns just like we do. And yeah, the sex was there too. Because of course that was an important part of life, but um, it wasn't like this all porny kind of sex that we had gotten in so many gay comics back then. Um, it was like this really interesting kind of like warm um, sex between characters that care for each other and, and loved each other, and that was really really, really important to see and very influential. Um, the more I think Thank about you. how I really think Howard changed the game for a lot of uh, of us, you know reading the uh, window strips uh, when I did was a great influence for me in terms of the community and the the way I ended up creating a world for the Brown Bomber and Diva. That was another way I felt like I was really influenced uh, by Howard. A lot of what Howard did, especially those, you know, the, the Wendell and Stuck Over Baby, came from his heart, you know, and his emotional state. And um, he outlined the struggles, you know, and his deepest feelings and what went on in his head, emotion, you know, emotionally um, stuff. And that, was, that really touches people, you know. And also he was one of the, the for, I think somebody might've said this already, it was like one of the first places where we saw ourselves, you know, um, and that's always huge. You know, because here we are, you know, we're gay. Some of us are, are of color. And where did we see gay characters? Like, you know what I mean? Nowhere when he started. Um, so that, that is, that's a, always a breakthrough moment for people. You know, and that's, that's what I got from Wendell. I think probably the most groundbreaking thing about that strip was it was everything came from character. You know, it, it was very character-based. And that's always what I ended up doing with my strip curbside and, 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 and that's what Allison ended up doing with Dykes to Watch Out For too. I mean, I think it was more, things sprang more from their interiors than things happening to them. Although certainly a lot of things happened to them, a lot of outside forces. This was the Reagan years, which, you know, you reread it and you remember how hard those years were, how really difficult they were. Um, so yeah, that it was it was groundbreaking, and it and again it all sprang from character, and and it the characters were they were broad sometimes they they were a little larger than life, but they were all very very human. So. 
Yeah, one of the things that was so impressive about Wendell was that he included a very broad range of the gay community. So he had female characters, he had characters of color, he dealt with things like AIDS and the Reagan world of politics. But it wasn't like some of the early queer cartoons were very much one very small section of gay white men. And Howard really had a huge community in Wendell. Then Howard's next big project was Stuck Rubber Baby, which took many years to complete. Uh, it was published in 1995. And recently we've just come out with a new 25th anniversary edition of Stuck Rubber Baby. This is a graphic novel based on Howard's own experience of having a, producing a child accidentally. Um, and it took place in Birmingham during the civil rights uh, activities of the 60s and 70s, um, well, the 60s really, and Howard lived in Birmingham during that time. So he deftly wove together a story about a gay man coming to realization of his own sexuality with the backdrop of the civil rights movement. So he was dealing with a lot of very complicated topics. Um, and the, the art is incredible and mind blowing. You know, I was like, oh, it's, it's, it, this is gonna be another story of a white man experiencing civil rights, right? Um, so there was an issue out there first before I read it, but then when I read it and I saw how, how he weaved his own uh, coming out with the civil rights thing, how the people who helped him come out were people of color, how, how going to the, to the black gay bar was just such a, um, a huge experience for him and it kind of changed his life and how, it, how that's kind of story and the music and the way people were and the drag queens and the people he loved and all kind of mixed together. Then you knew, you just felt like it was just real, real authentic experience. And it just, it was a beautiful thing. It was a really beautiful thing. The art was impeccable, of course. I mean, and I could see that he took a long time to make it as good as it was, right? A really long time. It just ended up blowing me away because I thought that even when people of color appeared in the works of other queer cartoonists, uh, sometimes the, char the, the characters felt incidental. And I was just happy to see that people were incorporating other people of color in their works. But it, I was really astounded um, how Howard really balanced the, you know, those two communities, communities of color and queer, queer people. Uh, the story itself was powerful. The, the, the illustrations, the drawings were powerful. And there was just something about it that made me very, very much aware that it was a, a, a milestone in the world of, of, of comics. Thank you. That's one thing about Howard's work, it always made you want to do better because of his level of expertise. Yeah, Howard really had a gift for getting across the experiential ex experience of, uh, of, of um, being where he was at the time. And also, I mean, it's no small task to meld his uh, personal stuff with such a huge social backdrop you know, and he was just so, he was just, he was tight. He was just so good at it all. His draftsmanship, his, his uh, consistency and his, uh, his storytelling abilities were off the hook. Um, I remember he said to me once, you know, yeah, it took me four years. And I was like, you crosshatched for four years, <laughs> you know, his arcs, his crosshatching, his lettering, his character development, his storytelling. He was, you know, he had it all. He had it all. He was like the cartoonist, cartoonist. He did set the bar for us. I think we all, I mean, I'm the most inconsistent cartoonist out there. And sometimes I go, I'll do an arc or something. And I'll be like, oh my God, Howard would like, <laughs> you know, wretch over what I just did. But that was my style. He was truly inspirational. I mean, he just, he didn't cut corners, you know? And um, he'd come out with these tomes, you know, and he didn't hold back. He was not afraid to go into difficult subjects. Um, 
in fact, you know, I was, re I was on his website this morning just going, I haven't even seen all of his stuff. Yeah, he's mind blowing. And I love the little individual gags he would do, not to get off the subject, but um, he did like a two page one called Death. And he talks about, well, hopefully my, you know, after I'm gone, my work will make somebody chuckle. I was like, oh, Howard, you have no idea how much we love you and what a mark you left. You know, I think he'll see um, what's coming for him. I think he's aware of what's going on. One of our challenges, one of, and it's one that we all have to step up to, is write real, believable people of color and real, believable people who are not us. You know, and I think maybe every cartoonist should try, you know, writing somebody who's not them. Um, and he just was an inspiration for me and, and he wrote people that were really living, breathing characters. I really believe they were out walking on the street. And again, his character, his character building, his character work were so amazing on top of his stippling. That wasn't even so much cross hatching as stippling. And Howard was the stippling king, you know, on top of his great character work and his wonderful art. Yeah, one of the things about Stuck Rubber Baby is that it was so far ahead of its time. Uh, when it first came out, the New York Times never reviewed it because comics weren't considered legitimate books. Uh, you know, Howard was such a groundbreaker in terms of subject matter and how to address very deep topics in comics. Um, and that we forget that when he was doing that book, other nobody else had really done that except for maybe Mouse. But it it was way beyond what people thought comics could be. Howard's art was so amazing, but I also am really impressed with him as a graphic designer because he, his lettering was beautiful. His page layouts were beautiful. Stuck Rubber Baby had those bleeds. Um, the amount of thought and, and craft that went into every little detail of Howard's pages is, is is just so spectacular and time consuming. We all know how much effort it takes to do that kind of work. Um, and it's just inspiring and it lets us know what comics can be. I also wanna talk a little bit about Howard as a activist and a community builder. And I wanna say he, in a lot of his work, especially gay comics, being an editor and being a mentor, he created community for all of us. Um, and he also was an activist in the fact that just making a gay cartoon was a huge political statement. Um, so let's go around and talk about Howard as an activist and Howard as a community builder. Ivan? He built communities like no one else could. <laughs> he was like the guy, who pulled everybody together, um, whether it be for an art event or a social function. Um, and I think he kind of modeled that for us because I think all of us in this room uh, in some way does that now or does that in a career that we build, put people together. We, we do organization, uh, organizational events. We do community events. Um, we champion causes. We, we do work specifically with causes and get people around it. And he kind of role modeled a lot of that for us. I was very aware of how unique he seemed to me as a young cartoonist, because I think it's a very political act to, for any of us to draw cartoons that in some way embodies our community. And I was really aware of how Howard's work, to me, was really one of the uh, first strips that kind of embraced the idea of in intersectionality. It just, it just really encouraged me to um, open up the parameters of my strip to not simply deal with, um, you know, the world of gay dating or, you know, relationships and things like that. So to me, that's one of the lasting um, uh, legacies, I think, that that sticks with me that I got from Howard. I think Rupert said it very, very well. Um, you know, comics are activism, art is activism, um, but he opened it up for, for us, for queers. You know, it was an entirely new world. He opened the door. Um, 
you know, and like you said, it influenced you, Rupert, to open up your parameters. And I think he did that for a lot of people. You know, a lot of people have followed in that. And he, he gave us a, a huge voice, you know, and someone said it before, I think, how accessible comics are. You know, you can read a lot of theory, you can read a lot of, you know, the anarchist cookbook <laughs> and stuff like that. But like to open a comic book, and be drawn in by the art. You know, he was up on like the more Drucker level to me, like staring, 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 staring at a panel forever. And then, and then like you guys said, and then reading it, it was almost like to, the art blew you away. Um, but back to the point, yeah, he, he gave a lot of people permission and confidence and encouragement about, um, about tackling subjects. You know, like to, it took the fair away. He already did it and you knew there was readership. You knew you were gonna reach a lot of people. He, he, he showed us. He showed us how to do it. Yeah, he, Howard really paved the way. I mean, he he basically created the template with gay comics. I always thought about gay comics when I did my own anthologies in the ensuing years and tried to, you know, try to gather women together and men together. And um, and uh, yeah, he um, he had dimension and, and, and he brought that dimension to his output. And, and I know he was a huge activist and stuff. I'll stick to the comics because I didn't live in New York that long with him, but I'm, I know he did a lot of that. Gay comics, like starting gay comics was a real political act, a huge pro political act. And it really endangered his career to come out as gay doing, you know, doing so. And he was really open about that. And he paved the way for Jen Camper and Rob Kirby and Ivan Velez and Diane DeMoss and all the rest of us to like kind of be our authentic selves and, and try to, he gave us something to live up to. So love you, Howard. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I think I want to add one thing is that everyone always talks about how uh, humble and generous Howard was and he was that but he was also incredibly courageous and his his braveness is what allowed so much of uh the cartooning world to follow in his footsteps and i really again i can't imagine a world of queer comics without howard i feel him with us all the time you know i i, I miss i miss howard it's just this new reality that he doesn't exist in now Mm -hmm. It's just, it's, it's freaky to me, but I also know that I have enough of Howard inside of me already. It's like, he's in my heart and stuff. And I can't say that about a lot of people. I mean, mm -hmm. but Howard was the guy who got in there and, um, you know, and he affected me and he affected my work and he affected the way I felt about myself and about my work. And I just, I miss him, but I know that he's here. So it's, it's, I, it's just good that he can affect people like that, you know? Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, I, as much as we all miss him, I'm, I alternate between the sadness that he's not here and then the gratitude that we even got to live in a world with Howard Cruz. Yeah. Icon, love you, Howard. And thanks for every, and Howard, thanks for just for everything, like, you know, and it's so good to see you guys. I'm so glad we yeah. got to do this. I <laughs> know. Really, really, really great to, to see together. you guys. Yeah, yes, yes. Really. Yeah, it's really fun. Yeah. Very cool. Love you guys. Hello, thank you so much for, for being here. My name is Justin Hall. I'm uh, moderating this panel. I teach at the California College of the Arts, and I'm a cartoonist as well. So, Owan, I wanted to start with you. You're a scholar of comics as well as a cartoonist yourself. Um, so I'm wondering what your personal history with, is with Howard's work, and, and do you look at his legacy through two different lenses, as an academic and also as a creator yourself? I do. My personal history is that in the 1980s, when I was a college student, um, gay comics was one of my first exposures to the queer community beyond the limited experiences on my own campus. And as such, the everydayness of the lives depicted in the various comics in gay comics was um, really remarkable, as were the diversity of comic creators. So it gave me a sense of how big the world of queerness could be. Um, as an academic, I really look at uh, this pivotal moment, particularly in the 1980s, when we see gay comics and we see Wendell, um, in which 
uh, people at the margins realize that the, or kind of capitalize on the fact that just representing the diversity of their experiences, just living in their regular lives without necessarily anything particularly heroic is transgressive when they um, have been silenced in the past. Thank you. Um, Tara, Tara you're, you also wear two different hats as publisher, uh, publisher editor and also a cartoonist. Do you also kind of see Howard's uh, legacy through two different lenses? Well, certainly on the publishing side, you know, what my first exposure to gay comics was in the 80s and I was a sub closeted suburban teenager. And uh, back then we didn't have the internet we, and direct sales shops were afraid to carry anything that didn't turn a profit for them, namely the big two Marvel DC and some of the more sci-fi and action oriented indies. And uh, the only way I could get gay comics in the 80s was mail order and it would come to my house in a brown paper wrapper. And uh, I was afraid that my parents would get to it first and, uh, and, and to have some sort of uh, you know, fit of curiosity and the gig would be up. But, uh, but it was, you know, basically it was sort of a message from outside of Overland Park, Kansas, you know, that there are people who live their lives and they have, they have uh, different sexualities, different approaches to gender and life. And, and that was something that really affected me. Um, you know, just the idea that you know, that comics can do something different than deliver, you know, pulse pounding action on a monthly basis. Um, you know, the whole experience of, you know, discovering indie comics and Euro comics and as a teenager, but um, then also as a creator, I just was fascinated that a lot of, uh, you know, Howard's stories, you know, focused on fairly, you know, quotidian, quotidian issues and events and wasn't always, uh, you know, grand dramatic gestures. You know, you could make, you could make quite a story out of things that were seemingly, seemingly, uh, you know, seemingly a commonplace. And uh, another thing, perhaps a technical thing that always fascinated me about Howard Cruz was that he was notorious for using a rapidograph pen. And again, nowadays it's um, the Wacom pad and digital drawing that's going to destroy art as we know it. Back then the technological advance that was going to destroy art as we know it was the rapidograph pen. And I had then and still have hands too shaky to handle the brush. And so I, with my, with my Jack Kirby sized ham fists, w gravitated through the rapidograph pen because it was controllable and um, was told by much, much more talented people than I that I couldn't do that. That was not the right, you needed to use pro quills and brushes and realizing that three of my favorites, you know, uh, Howard Cruz, George Perez and Robert Crumb all used rapidograph pen sort of, sort of vindicated my, my choice. So that and necessi this necessitated it, but yes, Howard Cruz, uh, Howard Cusa made my teen years a little more, a little less bleak. Um, uh, uh, William, the, the two of us put together a book called Theater of Terror, Revenge of the Queers, and it was the last place that Howard was actually published before he died. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to what it was like, um, what it uh, might mean to have, to have a, a, an early pioneer like Howard in a book that was really trying to look towards the future of queer comics. Well, you know, Theater of Terror is filled with so many wonderful young queer creators and they're telling all these new stories within the alphabet that we haven't gotten to yet in the, in the community. Um, and that's all great and valid, uh, but it was so rewarding to have um, a, a couple of the pioneers from uh, early queer comics, including Howard Cruz, to be a part of this. You know, Howard's work is, is kind of, still relevant and timeless. You know how some artists are a sign of their time or kind of go out of fashion? That wasn't Howard Cruz. Um, he's, all of his work is still very, very relevant right now to what's going on in the world um, within queer communities and outside of queer communities as well. Um, so it was great that, that he was, you know, a part of this continuation of queer comics. Um, and also because it's a horror comic, uh, I was quite surprised that he wanted to be involved, to be honest, but even though his work isn't usually categorized as, as horror, there is this, you know, he handles this sense of anxiety or oppression or all of these things that we in the queer community do find horrific um, very well, but he handles it also with humor and, and lightness. Um, so, you know, what it, his entry for Theater of Terror was was fantastic. I was so happy to have him be a part of it. And we had no idea that that was going to be his last published work. So it's it's bittersweet, but it's still very, I find it very rewarding. Um, uh, Steve, uh, speaking to that idea of um, Howard, the kind of uh, Howard's work um, 
having this sort of um, uh, uh, emotional resonance to it. Uh, uh, you do a lot of uh, really intimate stories about gay men um, and Howard in many ways uh, carved that path for, for that sort of work to be done. There was an authenticity, uh, emotional authenticity to his work that was really quite remarkable and, and um, a groundbreaking in its day. Do you look to him as a inspiration for the stuff that you do? Um, ab absolutely, both both directly and indirectly. I'd, I'd kind of avoided his work a little bit when I was still coming out because I found Barefoot's a little bit twee and people in their 20s can be really rigid about what is cool and what's not cool. Um, when I was coming out, um, I think I read Stuck Rubber Baby in the middle of um, my coming out process or like I, I came out late, I was 26 and, and in a lot of ways my coming out process and my coming out as a cartoonist processes are very intertwined. Comics have this great ability to sort of be this space to figure out identity. There, there are masterful places to work on identity issues and I don't know why, but I think that's so why so many LGBTQ people are in sort of invested in that space. And so for me, it was absolutely doing that. And his work was, was inspirational in trying to figure out who I was and by extension, what the world around me was. Uh, the, you see that in, in his own personal journey. Uh, Barefoots was, before he, um, was made before he came out. And then he came right. out and his work just you know, went up a level, right? Just you know, uh, in terms of craft, in terms of authenticity and and scale. It's hard. It people can people can tell when you're being fake, and it's hard to be authentic when you're not being authentic to your yourself. Yeah. And so the, the 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 I mean, we're all personas to some extent, but the the more of a the more you can make that gap smaller between what you present in the world and what's inside of you, the more people kind of like respond to that. And his work, as you said, Barefoots was sort of cutesy, and it was it was. It was constructed, and, but his, his gay comic stuff felt far less constructed and Stuck Rubber Baby feels, it's like not constructed at all. I mean, it is obviously, it's, it's masterful and it's, it's, there's skill there, but it doesn't feel like artifice. It feels like his documented observation of a period of time. And that's why I think it's, it works. It's, it, it's not just about being gay, it's about being human and, and all of the things that pour in out of that. Um, uh, one of uh, one of the um, when when Howard started Howard and Dennis Kitchen started the gay comic series, they essentially created a um, a letter and sent it to everybody in uh, Dennis Kitchen's Rolodex, uh, all the cartoonists that they knew, uh, not knowing who was queer or not or closeted or not, and just it was a shout in the in the out into the dark basically, um, to to see if there would be enough people you know to contribute to this. And one of the lines from that letter is. Our silence has allowed myths and pointless hostilities to poison our lives and the lives of the straight people around us. It's time to take some risks in the service of the truth. Um, can some of you maybe respond to that statement? What, what does that mean to you? Um, I can speak to that a little bit because um, when I think about that statement and when I think about Howard Cruz in general, I think about you know this important role of gay comics in moving queer representation, especially in comics, into the realm that other groups had found very emancipating also. There's that key moment when the Black Power movement realizes that just writing poems about how Black people live every day, when Black people have been silenced or represented by others, is transformative. It gives us permission to be as Black people. Comics uh, across ethnicities made that other clear pivot, and it was really very much, you know, ushered in gay comics in some ways. Of course, there were queer and trans comics before that, but in terms of that shift into how we are, how we be, you have permission to be all the different ways that we are queer, trans, um, alphabet people. Um, that was the moment and it was, it was really transformative. I feel that um, one of the functions of art in general and especially, you know, for those of us, you know, being queer who, you know, seek out, you know, you know queer content as the word is these days, you know, early on in your, in your teens, you know, uh, when you're just figuring this out, this is how you get to know yourself. You know there's something different about you, you're not exactly sure what it is. And so you, your impulse is to seek out other people who may be like you or may have something in common with you. And that was the beauty of, in, for me, in gay comics in the, the 80s to sort of uh, stamp, sample, the, sample the, the world of, uh, of, of, of gender and orientation and see 
which of these might be, you know, might be relevant, relevant to me, but they were all informative. And of course, the second thing is simply, you know, the V word visibility. I mean, making sure that people know you're there. I mean, first you have to rally the troops. You have to reach the people who are like you, but second, you have to be able to present that to the straight cisgender world who are very, who can very easily ignore you simply because they don't have to have to encounter you if you're not out there and if you're not vocal and if you aren't, you know, in print and, you know, uh, in the media, then they can, they can go their entire lives without having a thought about you all whatsoever. And that is the, that is the, the value of, uh, of queer comics from my, my standpoint as a lifelong comics reader. For me, I think it, it's about risk. And if you don't take risks on an artist, if, if, if there's a story in your head that makes you very, very uncomfortable that you can't get it out of your head, then it's probably the thing you need to write about and that somebody needs you to write about. Um, and you should probably do that rather than the thing that you know is gonna be crap pleasing that you know is gonna be safe. Um, and you, you can extrapolate that out from, it's not just about gender or sexuality or, or race, but it's, a, it's almost about anything. Um, uh, Howard really uh, possessed this kind of mind-blowing level of technical prowess. I mean, <laughs> everything from, uh, you know, um, Tara has mentioned before, the uh, his ability with the pen, um, his page compositions, his lettering is like so, like everybody, you can tell his lettering from a mile away. Um, and also the, the, just the scale of what he, what he was attempting, like his ambition with this. Step Rubber Baby was the first, you know, major queer graphic novel and it came out before the world was ready for it, to be perfectly honest. Um, so what, what do you see as the kind of uh, uh, legacy or inspirations that we can derive from, from his, uh, his storytelling abilities, his technical prowess, this ambition of his work? Well, he, he worked in a Bigfoot style, which is something that is, you know, you, you, would, you would think it would detract from the realism of his work. You know, he has this, this Bigfoot style, but at the same time, you know, it has the range of expression required to deliver, um, you, know, you know, sensitive emotion, emotional portrayals. Um, just in terms of, uh, you know, the sort of techniques using to, to build an image. I mean, there's all this, you know, stifling the, you know, these sort of just uh, crisp line work that's, you know, that, that just, uh, just, it just looks like, you know, has this otherworldly quality that it's, it's like, it, you know, pr produced by machine or something sometimes um, in a very positive sense. I'm pro-machine, by the way. But um, I, I think that, uh, you know, but, you know, and people sort of presume that when somebody chooses to adopt a Bigfoot style, you know, something more cartoony, so to speak, that it, it is sort of, it belies a lack of craft or a lack of technical wherewithal. And um, one of the things that I should not have been surprised to see, but, but was slightly surprised to see is we published the Queer Heroes Coloring Book in conjunction with Alphabet, uh, and a publication on which I was very pleased that Howard Cruz was gracious enough to contribute to. He also contributed an illustration of Ian McKelling to the coloring book. And the caricature of McKellen was immaculate. I mean, it, there was none of those, you know, we've, we've all seen those characters like, oh, that's supposed to be so-and-so, you know? And we kind of let it go and we move on because it's not that important that it's pitch like, like a lot of the stuff I draw when I do caricature, you know? Uh, Howard Cruz nailed it. I mean, it was perfect. I mean, it was, you actually absolutely knew it was Ian McKellen. It was unavoidable and in, in two different guises as well. I can say that the first time that I read um, Stuck Rubber Baby, like you, you hear all these great things about Howard Cruz being um, pioneer in, in queer comics. So I was going into it with a queer point of view and I was not expecting to see the wonderful shades of skin that he got across just in his hatching. I mean, that in itself shows so much um, inclusion and diversity just to have not just black people in this black and white comic who aren't just flashes of black ink, um, but actual, you know, texture to create skin and skin of various tones, various black tones. Um, I just, I was blown away the first time I read that just by that, that technique. Uh, he, he actually, the original pages for, for Stuck River Baby are two and a half times print size, which wow. is, and, and he, he said he did it because specifically because of skin tones because yeah. he could go in and, and do the cross hatching, do the stippling to, to make it right. And there's the only way he could do it, which meant that he spent five days on each page. Yeah. And it meant he went into bankruptcy to produce the book. 
<laughs> but but I, I agree with you. Like it's so magnificent, it's so lush and like, I'm so glad that this 25th anniversary edition that's come out, coming out now is actually slightly larger because it can show off some of that. Like, so it does, you do see the handwork behind all the, all those tones. Um, it's magnificent. Um, in terms of the, you know, you, you think about Sucker Rubber Baby as this, you know, massive, you know, I, I would argue it's, you know, maybe the, the great American graphic novel if we have one, because it, it does deal with so many different issues around, you know, race and gender and sexuality. And it's it, it set in the Alabama, the civil rights era, this incredibly pivotal kind of moment in American history. Um, and um, the, the scale of it is so remarkable. Uh, does, does that sort of scale and ambition um, uh, infor, uh, inspire you, you folks as creators? Absolutely. I mean, one of the one of the things that when 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 Stuck Rubber Baby was published in 1995, long form comics work was still relatively rare. We'd had Mouse, um, Dave McKean was working on Cages, but like books with like a discrete beginning, middle, and an end that weren't like sections of series. They were still relatively pretty rare. A lot of what we call art comics was still trying to figure out how to be quote unquote novelistic. And, I, and while I hate that term in a lot of ways, if any book is novelistic, Stuck Rubber Baby is, it, it sort of set a high watermark of like, if you're going to do something and you're going to be ambitious and gay theme, you better bring your A game. And it's, you can't just tell your life story because although it's loosely autobiographical, it's not about him. It's not, this is my life and it's intrinsically interesting because it's happened to me. He's trying to say, as you write, the great American novel, it's about the 60s. It's about the, the black power movement and the rise of civil rights and, and about the whole milieu that was happening there. And this one guy who's kind of a dick, really. I mean, he's not a dick. He's just sort of passively being sort of swept along in history. And his stand-in is the least interesting character in the book. He's like, he vaguely comes to a realization that he's gay. But he's surrounded by all of these fantastic people. And I wish some, I wish a lot more autobiographically themed work, including my own, would be a little less solipsistic and self-involved and more like, what is the world that we are in? And so, yeah, he set, he set standards because the, the, the thing that that book communicates is what I've been doing all along is not good enough and I am going to stretch and accommodate my artistic prowess to fit the ambition of the work that I'm trying to tell. And, and he did it. And if only, we, only the rest of us could do it half as well. Uh, there is actually a, uh, uh, Alison uh, Bechtel, when, because she was absolutely inspired by this to create Fun Home, and she, uh, a phrase that she describes um, when she was making Fun Home that she felt so, um, you know, uh, it was such a difficult process for her that she had to imagine herself as a larger person, as a kind of a better person in order to tackle this project. So she was literally reimagining herself in order to, to do this thing. Um, and that that's always kind of stuck with me, and I think that's something that that Howard represents in a lot of ways. You know, he had to make himself a bigger person in order to do this bigger thing. Right. Um, what, what what I take from his work when I do my own autobio is like I'm not really I'm not doing something because it's about my life. I'm trying to write about something, and I'm using my life as a vehicle into the content that I'm trying to write. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I'm there is sort of incidental, and that's totally that book. Mm -hmm. I just want to mention quickly, when we think about um, Howard's work, also the idea of um, a white cis male comic creator <clears throat> writing black characters in a way that does not make him the hero of the story, make the, that character the hero of the story, is a model for um, filmmakers novelists, uh, graphic novelists moving forward. And it is um, that he did it so well um, when that was not something that was happening that much. I, I don't know if it's happening that much now. I think that that bears mention he deserves, I mean, that's that's such an important thing that he accomplished. I completely agree, and I, I have to say that um, I think he was really ahead of, of the times with uh, Stuck Rubber Baby. I mean, it's obviously a document of what was happening then, but right now in, in this historic period that we're in currently, um, 
the topic of white privilege and what that means and how to be an ally and, and what is actual um, allyship uh, has come up and is so prominent right now. And I feel like Stuck Rubber Baby is, is a great examination of white privilege and, and how to, you know, better yourself into being an ally kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. I would I would also say that um, to add to that that uh, that as an editor, he also put that into practice not only in his own work, but like he was sure to in um, you know editing gay comics that there were uh, creators of color that there were you know women um, as well as men, and it's the first as far as I can tell the first out trans comic by an out trans person, um, I am me by David Kotler, and I think gay comics number three. Um, was in those pages. So, um, you know, he was, he fought to open doors up for everybody as much as possible. He was, uh, you know, a, a community builder in, in, a, in a way that's really quite remarkable. And I think it's felt to this day. Thank you all. You're amazing. <laughs> all love and strength during these difficult and challenging times. And thank you so much for coming together for, uh, to, to uh, honor Howard in this, in this particular way. So, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Yes. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Awesome.